and please make yourself settled. And maybe take a couple of deep breaths. Oh yeah, wiggle your head, roll your shoulders, <laughs> whatever it is, before you gently close your eyes. So we'll sit for 25 minutes or so, but of course time will have no meaning for you. <laughs> and then we'll have a dumb reflection and some questions as well. Can you still hear me when I speak quite softly like this? Great. Lovely. So really taking your time to settle in. Even just allowing yourself that time can help transition from a busy, often rushed out outer world of activity and just help to remind the mind that now is a time for slowing down. Generally, we watch what naturally arises in the mind. But right at the beginning, if you wish, you can take two or three slow, intentional breaths. Breathing in, inhaling the energy, the joy of being together. Feeling the uplift of the incoming breath. And breathing out. Imagining tensions being released, the body dropping down, a little closer into the ground. Intentionally offering yourself this space to connect deeply, to listen within and to offer yourself the kind of care and nourishment that your body and mind really need. So this is your gift to yourself, the gift of your presence, a presence that demands nothing, no expectations or goals. If you can develop that sense of kindness enough to offer yourself this gift, that's wonderful. If you're more of a devotion, devotional type of person, devotional mind, you might wish to offer this time to the Buddha. So your practice, your silence is a gift to him.
and imbuing your awareness with that sense of kindness, generosity, and intention to care. Just gently in your own time, spreading your awareness through the body. Imagining it nourishing each and every cell. You're welcome to do it in your own speed. in the order that you prefer, but I'll just give a very gentle guidance for those whom it might help. So starting at the top of the head, feeling any sensations, and imbuing that mindfulness with kindness and care. Spreading through the face, every part of the forehead and the brow. Without judging. Just allowing this kindness to enable any tensions to relax. Perhaps loosening your jaw slightly. Softening, relaxing the tongue. Coming into your neck and shoulders. Welcoming them into this space. Just feeling in to those areas. Leaving words and language aside. And so you're listening deeply. to what your body wants to say. Moving down the arms to the hands. Noticing each and every finger. If you don't feel any sensations in any part of the body, just resting your attention in that area. With a sense of kindness, patience and warmth. A 
allowing the light, the brightness of mindfulness to turn up in its own time. And spreading this kindfulness through the chest. Including the ribs. The abdomen. The entire trunk. Perhaps spending a little longer on any areas that are tense or tight. Just to get to know them. before continuing to explore the area of the back. From the upper back to the lower back. Not forgetting the armpit and the sides of the body. Noticing any sensations in your buttocks. Maybe heaviness. The field of weight. Pressure. Or tingling. without needing to label. Just receive whatever you experience there. And allowing your awareness to flow down through the thighs, the parts which may be touching the floor or the chair, the tops, the sides of the thighs. Maybe staying on the surface or exploring deep inside. There's no right or wrong way.
suffusing your knees with kindness. Softening around any tension. Knowing the difference between little changing pains or stretching feelings and anything that hurts or harms the body. Sometimes we find that simply relaxing our awareness, softening, deepening into the experience can bring about more space, more freedom in those sensations. Conversely, when we hold too tightly, get attached to any feeling in the body. Sometimes we intensify those sensations by the way we're aware. So find out what kind of attention is needed to relax and find ease with whatever you experience in this present moment. Continuing into the shins, the calves, the ankles and the feet. until every little part of the body is included in this field of your awareness. You wish widening your attention now, as though getting a bird's eye view of the whole body and mind, sitting in time and space, just poised in this present moment.
noticing the silence in the body. The world beyond language and thought. Noticing any space, spaces in the mind between the thoughts. So the thoughts were simply passing clouds, wafting in and through the sky. Nothing to hold, nothing to own, nothing worth clinging on to. And instead, in any space in the mind, in the silence, see what qualities you'd like to infuse there. So that spaciousness becomes enlivened of kindness, warmth, maybe softness.
So we're coming to the end of the meditation already. For those who wish, of course, you can carry on. From this place of calm, awareness, receptivity, you can listen to the talk. Those who wish <clears throat> to come out and open your eyes, please do so only after looking back inside your body and mind. Suffusing once again the whole body kind awareness, thanking your body for cooperating, for being still, for helping your mind to become present. Offering a way for you to practice kindness. Noticing any feelings of peace. Calm, maybe brightness in the mind. And just reflecting on how that came about. What did you do or didn't do? That allowed the mind to settle, even a little bit. So we can close by again, just taking a few deep breaths and really enjoying the experience of simply breathing in and breathing out. At the end of the third breath, if you wish, you can open your eyes. <coughs> Very good. <clears throat> it seems like such a short meditation session. <laughs> Just long enough to allow ourselves to relax a bit and establish the right attitude. But really, that's all you need in practice. Because it's not so much what arises in the mind, but the field in which that arises in. You know, and how are you filling that space between the mind and the object of your awareness? This is really the key to the practice. Are we filling it with beautiful qualities or are we filling it with craving, discontent, aversion, striving, grasping? So these are always things to be aware of and um, it's a very wonderful way to practice because it is beyond the, the realm of concepts you're not actually doing anything it's more like you're just um, putting on a different lens if you like trying on different glasses <laughs> and seeing what effect that has seeing the power of the mind to um, influence our experience you know 
and realizing that there is no objective way things are, at least until we overcome what we call the five hindrances of the mind. We're always, um, our view, our screen, our perceptions always colored but at least we can try to learn to color it with, in wholesome ways. <laughs> so today I came up with the title, like the moon freed from clouds. Sometimes, I don't know, you have to think of something to talk about. So uh, the moon in Buddhism is quite a significant uh, symbol of purity, of radiance, of illumination, yeah. Especially, I think the moon is particularly beautiful because it's obviously the light that shines in the darkness, right? Of course, the sun also rises and dispels the dark fully, but the moon is actually existing within that darkness and providing light. So it's a very beautiful symbol and we live as monastic Buddhists in, um, in harmony with the cycles of the moon. So we have our Aposita days and then we have our uh, Patimoka days if we're fully ordained. Um, every two weeks at the dark or the new or the full moon. I think it's, it's the dark and the full, yeah. So, and this next moon actually is Sangamita Day, which is quite an important Buddhist uh, celebration. It's one of the six big Buddhist festivals celebrating the arrival of um, the great bhikkhuni elder Sangamita Teri. And uh, she was actually the daughter of the emperor Ashoka and came to Sri Lanka from India in a boat carrying the Bodhi tree. And uh, not only did she establish the Bodhi tree, but she established the Bhikkhuni Sangha over there. So very special time. And it's often these full moon days that we, um, we have our Buddhist festivals. And as I say, we recite our, our monastic code of virtue as well. So it's also a synonym. The moon free from clouds is also a synonym for the awakened mind. So there's a lovely verse, which I like, which is one of the reasons I um, have the name I do, actually. My first teacher gave me the name Chanda, and that means moon. And uh, I added Visuddhi on the end because it means pure, like the moon. But also it's Ajahn Brahm's um, royal name, so Chao Kun name. So it's his second title. So I took a, one name from my first teacher and one name from Ajahn Brahm, my second teacher and preceptor. So but the verse that uh, describes this is in the Dhammapada and this is describing uh, the state of someone fully enlightened so the Buddha says it's the Brahmanavaga for those who are interested in looking it up for themselves so he says whoever is spotless like the moon I think that's the word Vimalam who is pure serene and unperturbed Who's, who has destroyed delight in existence, them I call a true Brahmin. So there was always a thing in the Buddha's day that you know people would be very proud about their caste and about their ranking. And the Buddha used to um, turn around those concepts and say that one is not a Brahmana through birth. You know, you're not a Brahmana because you're born in a good family, but you're a Brahmana when you actually purify your mind and become pure, serene and unbelievable perturbed and even further than that destroying delight in existence they're the ones I call the true Brahmana so they're the ones who've actually attained liberation from the round of rebirth yeah. so this is the kind of ultimate goal of the path but I wanted to talk about um, how we can learn to dispel those clouds what those clouds are in the mind and how we can brighten up our own minds so that we can see this moon coming out from the clouds, whether that's the moon in the sense of a beautiful, pure virtue that then has this radiance on one, in one's features, on one's face, or whether it's the moon that comes out from behind the five hindrances, like the nimitta, when the five hindrances and the five senses disappear. This can also be seen as like a beautiful moon-like disc in the mind. And, and the Buddha says at that point, the mind is liberated and it, the word is um, vimochayam, chittam, like the liberated mind, but it means the, the mind that's liberated from the five hindrances and the five senses of sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. Yeah, so it doesn't mean full liberation at that stage. 
Um, and then, of course, there's the, uh, the moon, which is this beautiful, purified mind that is free from the rounds of rebirth, as I said. So there's various places in the suttas where the Buddha uses this analogy of the moon to describe um, the mind and also the analogy of clouds to describe the defilements and the obscurations of the mind. And one of them is um, in the Anguttu Nikaya, number, the book of the fours, number 50. And here it's quite a gross defilements, I would say, but I wanted to just mention this because, you know, we can start off where we are, right? And some of us might feel very defiled, even if we get a little bit of uh, defilement in the mind. Um, actually, I don't like the word defiled. I prefer the word obscuration or even affliction. That's quite a nice one to think that we're actually afflicted um, by something that causes suffering, right? Rather than feeling that we're actually um, dirtied or defiled. Because as I said, you know, the Buddha described the... Um, the kilesas, let's use the Pali language, as adventitious. So it means they're not always there. They come in when there's an opportunity, an opportunity for them to come in, but they're not part and parcel of your mind. Yeah, they have their cause and they have um, causes to be eradicated also. So there are things we can do to overcome them. So none of these states are permanent. So anyway, in this um, sutta, the Buddha says, uh, monastics, there are four defilements of the sun and the moon because of which the sun and moon do not shine, blaze and radiate. What four? Clouds are a defilement of the sun and moon because of which the sun moon, and moon do not shine, blaze and radiate. Fog is a defilement of the sun and moon. Smoke and dust is a defilement of the sun and moon. And Rahu, the lord of the Asuras, is a defilement of the sun and moon, because of which the sun and moon do not shine, blaze and radiate. So they sound a little bit obscure, perhaps, and I'm not sure exactly Rahu, the lord of the Asuras, it's some kind of mythical creature who's um, a little bit uh, dis of a disturbance, I think, not like Mara, but some sort of mythical um, creature that's described in the suttas. So we don't have to worry about that so, so much. But then he likens these four defilements to the Brahmins and ascetics who basically um, don't keep their sealers. So in this case, um, the Brahmins and ascetics are drinking liquor and wine and do not refrain from drinking liquor and wine. And then they're indulging in sexual intercourse, even though they're supposed to be celibate. And then they accept gold and silver and do not refrain from accepting gold and silver. You know, most of you will probably know that most monastics, uh, at least in the Theravada tradition, have a vow not to handle money at all. And then there are some ascetics and Brahmins who earn their livelihood by wrong livelihood and do not refrain from wrong livelihood. And because of this, those ascetics and Brahmins do not shine, blaze and radiate. So here he's likening them to... Um, the moon or the sun when it is obscured by clouds, mist, smoke and dust. So even for lay people, this is very um, enlightening because we can look at the opposites of these gross misconducts and we can say, OK, well, why is alcohol clouding the mind to such an extent? And if you think about it, it's the opposite of sobriety. It's the opposite of clarity, of brightness. Yeah, of lucidity. And these are the qualities we really want to be developing in order to energize the mind so that the mind can become bright and, and very, very clear and know that what it's seeing is correct to the truth, in line with the truth. Yeah. And then the opposite of this sexual misconduct. I mean, in this case, he was talking about Brahmins, you know, aesthetics who actually are indulging in sexual intercourse. And this is really, really gross. If you're a monastic and you do that, you're basically automatically disrobed. Unfortunately, some people may keep on the robes. Hopefully it's very few people who behave this way. But um, one who does this has actually committed um, a parajika offence, which is one of the most um, severe offences. That means you can actually never re-enter the monastic life. But for lay people, you know, the precept is to abstain from sexual misconduct. And on the opposite side, of course, this makes one a trustworthy person. It makes one loyal, reliable you know, a, a cause for non-harm. 
And also, I think it means that the mind is not so stirred up. It's not so agitated, you know, by this loss, this thirst for sensuality, because often you find the more you indulge, the more you tr are trying to fill something up. You know, we kind of sometimes use sensuality, whether it's sexual pleasure or any other of the pleasures of the senses, to fill some kind of void that's there. Whereas actually, it's much more helpful to feel into that loneliness, that void, that sense of perhaps some kind of lack and really get to understand and know that, yeah, without involving another person to who we then become very dependent on. So it's not that, you know, having relationships is forbidden or wrong, but there are definitely reasons to avoid indulging in these things. And again, it's to bring that kind of energy to the mind because the energy of indulging in sensuality is a kind of, it's a quick fix. It's a sort of quick high, but afterwards you'll probably find you're quite tired and, um, and the mind can then swing into a sort of groggy, um, discontented state. So then not to accept gold and silver for a, a lay person, I think, means coming out of greed, you know, accepting only what you really need, not what you don't need, living according to one's needs rather than one's wants, and being really honest about that, you know, developing qualities like generosity, which is the foundation of the path, yeah, and it starts to bring us out of self-centeredness, thinking that I have to have my needs met, and you know, and, and forgetting about other people, forgetting about everyone else. So especially at this time of year, it's lovely to think about, you know, donating to charities, maybe refugee charities or charities that support the homeless and the poor. And yeah, I was looking in my um, fridge and my cupboards recently, especially my Riverford vegetable box arrived. And sometimes there are some things I can't have. And so I'm always thinking, you know, who can I give these to? And I was wondering, maybe I can give it to a food bank or, or someone else. Um, and during my rains retreat, you know, I was living in solitude here and um, getting really well fed. And once a week, there would be an Italian lady in the neighborhood who'd come and offer me some food and just leave it outside without even disturbing me. She was like a little mouse, you know, totally pure hearted giving without expecting anything in return at all not even a smile or a hello or a thank you but I devised this little um, lovely little method whereby I could leave a few of the things that I wasn't using outside for her so I'd put some fruit and vegetables in the box and sometimes her meal would arrive and there'd be this beautiful exchange and there was this other time there was a lady who um, is actually quite an amazing person she's part of the Oxford Insight Group and she runs a lot of um, mindfulness and other training courses for people who experience burnout and particularly for activists and she lives not so far away but yeah it's a good 20 minutes walk and uh, maybe once a month I'd walk over to her place and kind of knock on the door and then run off down the drive just so she could like catch a glimpse of me before I left and I'd leave the food outside and I'd see her sort of look surprised and give me a little wave and the joy that I experienced in my heart was so strong it I just have a big smile on my face as I was coming back you know especially because I didn't have any sort of contact there wasn't that sense of really knowing how I was serving others because at that time I was very much practicing to deepen my own um, samadhi my own contentment my own uh, meditation but this would really give me a, a, a boost that would sometimes last for the whole day, you know? And the other beautiful thing is that when we live a virtuous life, we have the opportunity to, to reflect on the things that we're doing and the, the miracle, if you like, of kindness and how even a small little kind act can be so powerful, not only for ourselves, but for others in ways we can't even measure. So, and the last um, thing that was mentioned in that sort of was wrong livelihood. And so for us, of course, is whether as monks and nuns, we also have livelihood, right? And our livelihood is to share the Dhamma. Um, for lay people, just to choose a livelihood that serves, that minimizes the harm we do in the world. And it can be nuanced, you know. There was a discussion recently on social media um, and there was this man who started off by having um, a place 
I'm not quite sure why he had shrimps, but he had a lot of shrimps and he was looking after them <laughs> and just treating them nicely. But over time, it started to become commercialized because people wanted to buy his shrimps. And so he had this real ethical dilemma about what to do because he knew he was, you know, obviously killing them in order to move into um, making this a business. And yet at the same time, he was aware that he was really treating them as well as he possibly could. And, you know, um, holding really high animal welfare and ethical standards in his business and realizing that he was filling a niche that perhaps other people wouldn't fill with such kindness. So he was sort of asking, what do I do about this? And I said, you know, you'll probably um, get a lot of different opinions on it, but it is a nuanced thing. And I think for you, you really have to look at how it's affecting your mind. You know, does that sense of remorse and regret keep arising? Does it create a lot of doubt? Or can you focus on the good aspects and the aspects in which you are serving with right intention and see if that can, can grow? You know? So this is a much, much better approach, I think, than saying this thing is wrong, this thing is bad, this thing is evil. Because to be alive means we have to um, simply try to live as far as possible to reduce the harm we cause. But it's not possible not to cause any harm as a human being or as any living being simply in the act of survival. So then I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, the hindrances to meditation, because obviously through living a virtuous life, we start to undermine the course of defilements in the mind. But there are these um, still fairly coarse defilements or sorry, afflictions that can arise in meditation when we're trying to settle the mind. And uh, and the Buddha says that these things are obstructions that weaken wisdom and that actually nourish delusion. So they feed, um, they feed delusion, so, which keeps distorting the truth. So it's really important to learn how to overcome these and to have diligence in overcoming them. So there's another lovely sutta where the Buddha says that um, just as the radiance of the stars does not amount to one sixteenth part of the radiance of the moon, and the radiance of the moon is declared to be chief among the stars, so too whatever wholesome states um, exist, all are rooted in diligence, converge upon, dil upon diligence, and diligence is declared to be the chief. So how can we become diligent in overcoming these hindrances? And I think first of all, again, it's about letting go gradually, you know, of the course of things and moving on to the more refined, even in terms of um, the things that cause us happiness, you know, moving away from sensuality and moving into the pleasures of the mind. This can be a real um, encouragement for the mind that wants to deepen meditation, just to start to familiarize with a different kind of peace, a different kind of happiness that comes from inside. And we can start by doing this even in our daily life with what the Buddha called guarding the senses. And this is a way that we can start to become wise to cause and effect. So we can start to become diligent about how we use our minds in ways that lead to wholesome states increasing, beneficial, beautiful states of mind. And we can become diligent about not allowing the mind to go down avenues which only lead to stress. Yeah. So one, one example of that recently was um, that I was talking to Ajahn Brahm, as usual. <laughs> He's my kind of sounding board somehow. And, uh, and I was saying, you know, it's really hard work over here and I'm really not sure what's going to happen after the lockdown because we haven't been able to have guests for so long. And sometimes I feel sad about that because we, you know, we rented this place in Oxford, really looking forward to welcoming all of you here, not all of you at once, because it's only a little place. <laughs> but some of you have been over. And I think this year we were going to get a lot more visitors and and start to feel like we were really taking steps, you know, towards um, towards making it work here, first of all, but eventually towards having a bigger place. So then I said to Ajahn, you know, that I'm feeling this kind of sense of urgency in a way to move ahead with the project, but that I worry that if we go too fast, I'll be kind of so exhausted by the time we move into another place, then I'll just have to say, OK, I got us to this point. I'll have to basically back right off and let somebody else take over because I'll be just so tired, you know. 
And there's a lot of reality to that. You know, sometimes I feel very tired now and I think I'm not sure how much longer I can go ahead with this. But it's so interesting that, you know, based on how we feel at that moment, we project into the future and always look for the worst case scenarios. I'm not sure if this is an, a function of the amygdala or, you know, the fight flight kind of <laughs> animalistic response that we want to protect ourselves from the worst um, case scenario. But he just said to me, yeah, well, you know, that could happen. That is one of the possibilities. But there are so many other possibilities that could happen. You know, there are so many more. And just saying that opened up all these different pathways in my mind and I realized, yes, you know, why don't I choose one that's going to energize and brighten up the mind? So it's like this with every thought we have, you know, and it's like this with thoughts we have about people too. Interestingly, one of my friends was writing to me today. She turned up on the uh, call. So this is one of the reasons I chose this title of the talk. But she was saying how busy she is and how many huge responsibilities she has that really make mine fade into insignificance. And uh, basically, she's quite fortunate where she lives. So she's able to go swimming in this beautiful warm sea in between her meetings and her conferences, you know, and all the, the work she does. Um, but the other thing she's still doing, amazingly so, is uh, at least one hour, usually two hours of meditation. And she's got quite some skill in the practice. So she does get up this brightness in the mind, you know, what the Buddha calls a nimitta from time to time. And she said to me today that, unfortunately, there were clouds across that nimitta. There were like, uh, you can say again, like sort of uh, obscurations of the mind. And being a wise lady herself, she could identify the cause and she identified it to um, the way she was using her mind in everyday life. And so she said, oh, I think this is because I've been judging my colleagues. <laughs> and so because of that judgmental attitude, the nimitta wasn't so bright. And this is the thing, isn't it? You know, this is really where the learning lies because it's not really a problem that you have these clouds and that the nimitta is not so bright. The main thing that we're here to learn is how the mind works and what kind of um, conduct, how we can live a kind of life. And then how that kindness, how that skillful way of living, that wise way of being will have an effect on our mind. So this is the really important thing. And those clouds are just the adventitious defilements coming through and passing away, you know, and just giving them space to be there without, you know, focusing in and making them a problem because there's so much beauty also there in the mind. So why is it that we always look at the faults and we always worry about having to do something to get rid of them when they're simply visitors passing through? You know, so this morning I wanted to give some examples for my day to day because this morning and um, I woke up and I felt this kind of mistiness or fogginess in my mind. And of course, I woke thinking, oh, it's Sunday today and I haven't decided, you know, what to do for my Dhamma talk. And I could see this kind of impulse to try to <laughs> to try to brighten up my mind you know, maybe have a strong cup of tea or do something, you know, to get my mind in action. But getting wiser to the mind, I've started not to worry about it too much. And I woke up really nicely, actually, sort of with my hand on my heart. It was as though I was actually giving myself metta automatically as I woke. And uh, I remembered the night before also, when I went to bed, I was, um, it was interesting. I was feeling a little bit sad so this was last night so the night before last night I was feeling a little bit sad probably about the project a little bit and you know being here alone and the possibility of not getting to Australia again and so anyway without going into speculation about it this opening just happened in my mind and it was like the this big spaciousness sense of spaciousness arose and I realized that what I needed to put in that space was softness. And so last night as I was going to sleep and having this sense of sadness, there was also this, it was almost visual, almost like a cop like this, like a really big cop, this beautiful place where I could just fill with like a sense of softness. 
And it's so hard to put these things into words because it's an emotional quality of mind, but I just recognize that as a softness that would hold the sadness really, really gently, almost like cotton wool, you know, without sort of, um, I don't know, making a big thing of it or, you know, uh, giving it any kind of um, over importance in the mind, but just creating a soft space to hold all of that. So I went to sleep and I actually had a really nice sleep. But as I say, I woke up kind of groggy, but still giving myself metta as I woke. So I just felt that the best thing to do rather than like make myself bright and awake was just to gradually let this mist, this cloudiness disperse. So I took myself on a lovely walk and it was quite a sunny day and I was just walking along the river um, and I had this sort of uh, imagery like walking along, keeping my tiredness company, just in communion with that tiredness, you know, as if I'm taking my tiredness out for a walk. And the whole thing sort of helped me to just slow down and settle and even the Oxford dogs came to say hello. <laughs> and if you'd lived here as long as me by now, you'll know the Oxford dogs are really, they're not like the northern dogs who come and say, yep, yep, hello. <laughs> I'm sure they're all trained to kind of stay aloof, eyes downcast, and not to disturb anyone at all. So, But I noticed that as I was slowing down and just being intimate with myself in this way, the dogs, one of the dogs came right up to me and also kind of just hung out just in my presence. And that happened a little further along the walk as well. So I, I just allowed my mind to brighten up on its own and trusted that inspiration would arise, you know, and that's what happened on the walk. I got the inspiration for the talk and about how, you know, last week, I think at Oxford Insight, we talked about bringing a light mind to practice. I thought today we'll talk about the bright mind in practice and how that brightness comes around just through giving it time, you know. Because every time you get involved, every time you interfere and try to tell the mind how to be, you're just wasting energy. It's like the, the energy goes into the doing and away from what Ajahn Brahm calls the knowing part of the mind. Yeah, and it's that knowing part of the mind that we really have a chance to um, infuse with beautiful qualities. Yeah, just by being aware. The doer is just too active to really be present for very long, but the knower can, can wait. It can, you know, be patient and give space, give time and allow the mind to brighten and these beautiful qualities to shine. So I did also, <laughs> yeah, the time's kind of running out. It's funny. I always think that um, I've not got enough to share, but I wanted to share a little bit more about um, some of the finer hindrances to meditation. Because, yeah, I talk a lot about the five hindrances and one of the best uh, ways to overcome all five is contentment in the mind. Contentment can help reduce craving because if you're content, what do you want? You know, you're already satisfied. Contentment can help with aversion, you know. Why are we averse to something? Because we want something else most of the time. But if we can just remain content and even content to be unhappy, what we're actually doing is learning to um, overcome an unwholesome state with a wholesome state of mind. I'm going to this little class, which is, uh, I said I wouldn't tell you about, but <laughs> it's actually a lovely class with a, a very old um, Dhamma friend who I've known for many years, only haven't met for many, many, many years. And, uh, and as many of you know, I started off with the Vipassana, really um, focusing on uh, exploring impermanence in the body and mind. And the Burmese methods are often quite tied into the Abhidhamma, which Ajahn Brahm is always quite like, oh, Abhidhamma, it's this commentary, you know, it's not very um, literal, it's not the word of the Buddha per se. But this particular group's great because um, the person leading it is talking about the Abhidhamma from an early Buddhist point of view. So he's actually looking 
at parts of the Abhidhamma which relate directly to practice, which don't just list things, but talk about mental states. And he's linking this into the suttas and saying, you know, this is an example of where they say, you know, in the Satipatthana Sutta, for example, that one observes the mind which is exalted or the mind which is contracted or the mind with anger or the mind with lust. And one of the concepts there is that um, you can turn an unwholesome state into a wholesome state by the way that you're aware. So they call this the akusala becoming kusala. But akusala means unwholesome. So it's something like you can have a version in the mind, but by the way you look at it, by the beautiful wholesome state you bring to that experience, you actually change it into the wholesome experience because the power of the mind is so much stronger than any object it observes. And I thought that was really great to find that parallel, you know, between something from the Avidhamma and, and something which is throughout the early Buddhist teachings, that it's all about these beautiful attitudes of mind. And through those attitudes, we have the possibility to turn any unwholesome state around. Yeah. But not by force and not by wanting it to go away, because then you're bringing an unwholesome state to an unwholesome state. So our job is to bring a wholesome state of mind to however we experience whatever arises in the mind. So when we've done this in our daily life and with the um, coarser hindrances, we can move into looking at the upakilesas in the mind. And I think um, one of you here actually has looked at this upakilesa sutta since Ajahn Brahm's retreat because it's a very special sutta. And this actually talks about dealing with the very subtle defilements that come along at the stages of the nimittas arising in the mind. So I know that some of you here may be familiar with these things, some may not be right now. Either way, it really doesn't matter because the principles of the practice are the same. But so I'll just go through a few of them because I think it's really um, helpful to look at what can happen at this stage. And this sutta is particularly beautiful. It's the Upakilesa Sutta, Majjhima 128, because it starts off with the um, three monks who are living together in harmony. And the Buddha asks them, you know, how are you abiding? Are you living in harmony? And how do you live in harmony? He actually says, how do you practice mindfulness, right? How, yeah, that's right. He says, how do you remain diligent, ardent and resolute and mindful? And they explain that the way they do this is actually by living in harmony with each other. So one way of being mindful and of developing diligence is actually in the way we relate to other people and in having wise friends. And because of the way they live together, you know, always looking out for each other's needs, they have a fantastic foundation for deep meditation. And as a result, they're all getting into these beautiful states of mind. But even then, even though these three monks became great enlightened beings who are still remembered today, they also struggled at this stage when the light starts to arise in the mind. So in this sutta, they say to the Buddha, let's find the place. Okay. So. They say to the Buddha, Venerable Sir, we abide here diligent, ardent and resolute, and we perceive both light and a vision of forms. Yeah, so the word for that is nimitta in the mind. Soon afterwards, the light and the vision of forms disappears, but we've not discovered the cause for that. And Ajahn Brahm says that that's not a very good translation, but what it really means is we have not yet discovered how to master that and we we've not yet understood that nimitta and mastered that nimitta so then the buddha says you should discover the cause for that or you should learn to master that and then he says that this happened to him as well when he was still unenlightened <clears throat> he said i considered thus doubt arose in me and because of doubt my stillness fell away and when my stillness fell away, the light disappeared. I shall act so that doubt will not arise in me again. So this is the first upakile. So this is the first um, uh, more refined and subtle defilement that can come into the mind at this stage. So remember at this stage, a lot of the hindrances are overcome and there's already a lot of joy and energy in the mind. But then 
some kind of doubt still comes in the mind. So what kind of doubt is it at this stage? And the way I understand this is the kind of doubt that can come when you're not really sure what's happening. So you think, oh, what's, what's, I mean, you might not even break into thought, but there's this sense of, is this a nimitta? Or is it somebody shining a light in my face? You know, or the other common thing that comes off of people, what should I do next? And this is enough of a cause for doubt. And that doubt will then move the mind so that this uh, steadiness and the nimitta as a result will drop away. And then the next thing that he says is that when he was observing uh, the nimitta, uh, inattention arose in the mind. So this is very um, common, I think, that, you know, something arises in the mind, but we're not able to yet stay very steady and very focused with that thing. We're still, you know, a little bit dispersed and unfamiliar with just remaining in that passive, very still state of mind that allows things to arise and yet doesn't interfere with them and can sustain the energy and the interest in the object. So one of the ways that we can help to overcome this, if it should arise in our meditation, is by learning to be attentive in our everyday life. Yeah. So inattention is when you're sort of doing one thing, but you're thinking something else, or you've got in the back of the mind what you need to do next later in the day. So we're not able to just be with what we're doing right now. And when I read that, I thought that's really encouraging as a way to you know prepare the foundation for these stages in everyday life because really we're only ever doing one thing at a time you know you're either cooking or you're washing the dishes you shouldn't really be doing both at once <laughs> you know and we can focus on one aspect of that you know when you're washing the dishes you could focus on the, the sensation of the plates in your hand or maybe you can focus on the temperature of the water and just learning to pick out one thing and, and stay with that can help for this attention to become more steady and less likely to, to fall away. And so the next thing was um, a dullness arose in the mind. Yeah, here it's translated as sloth and torpor, but it's a kind of dullness that arises in the mind because even at the stage of nimittas, the mind might not be quite powerful enough yet to really sustain them uh, for very long. And one of the things that can often happen, I think, for meditators is that there's not enough joy in the mind. And this is why the mind becomes dull. Yeah. Mindfulness and joy go together. The more we, our mind starts to wake up and become aware, the more joy and energy we have. Yeah. So dullness is usually a low energy state. And again, at this stage, it's probably not like actual sleepiness, but we are unfamiliar with the subtlety of that territory. So the mind starts to become almost too calm and not clear enough. And one of the ways to overcome this, of course, is to put that joy and that energy into the mind right at the beginning of the meditation, if you can. You know, that's why I like to begin the meditations often about by just reflecting on the beauty of maybe something you've done that day or maybe reflecting on the qualities of the Buddha Dhamma Sangha or just feeling gratitude for being here and offering ourselves this time to practice. It can just help to arouse that energy, that joy in the mind before we start to let go. Yeah. And I've noticed for myself when I start to get calmer because you know it's maybe less familiar territory, sometimes the mind will get a little bit cloudy at first. And it's almost like, yeah, I think Ajahn Brahm uses the analogy of going into a darkened room. Your eyes take some time to open up and be able to see the, the shapes, you know, and, and avoid walking into things in the dark. But after a while, you get your night vision and you start to see more. Or it's like the analogy I gave last week of um, uh, the saver lamp. You know, I have this saver lamp in my dining room. And for the first couple of weeks that I lived in Oxford, I used to turn it on and then just turn it off again and use another room because I thought, oh, this light bulb's like too dull. It's no good. <laughs> I need to change the bulb. <laughs> and then after a while, one day I realized it was actually a saver bulb. And so if you just wait for a while and leave it on, it actually starts to brighten after a good five minutes. 
but so far I hadn't been patient enough. And it's the same thing with the mind, you know, when we start to see subtle things we haven't seen before, they might appear quite vague. You know, you're not quite sure what it is. And our habit most of the time is to try and go, oh, what's that? And of course that also disturbs the mind. But if we can just stay quiet and calm and just trust the process, like I did this morning on my walk, after a while the mist disperses, you know, the eyes, wake up or the light starts to shine and then you do start to see those things in the dark and you may even see the full moon come out from the clouds <laughs> and then the next two I think I need to stop soon because I'm talking too long but um, I did want to talk about the next two because they're the most common that can arise at this stage and these are the sense of fear that can arise and it's interesting because this is not the kind of um, startle response you know it's not that kind of fear of um, ordinary things in life it's not really a sense of anxiety but it's more of a kind of um, fear of the unknown so again you're entering different territory you're going beyond even where language can go and I can say from my own experience for someone who's practiced a lot with something maybe more tangible like bodily sensations or the breath that when these things start to happen they can seem very subtle and you're not quite sure exactly where you are yeah it's like you've gone on a walk to the park and you thought you knew the territory but then you realize you you're kind of somewhere that you didn't realize and at first you think well that you're not familiar with and at first you think have I got lost you know, and you want to come back to that familiar territory just to have a sense of control so that you feel that you know where you are. But actually, this is where trust comes in. And it can be really helpful to turn the mind back towards the refuges of the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha at this time. And just to realign yourself with that sense of trust knowing that you know, you're practicing the Buddha's path, that your teachers have walked this way. Ajahn Brahm is the master in describing this territory and he's described it so clearly, you know. And there's nothing to fear. The Buddha said, you know, some kinds of wholesome happiness should be pursued, they're not to be feared. And these nimittas, these jhanas are certainly something to be cultivated, not to be feared. So, this can really help to program the mind. And also just to see what it is you're afraid of letting go of, because usually it's a sense of control. Yeah, it's the sense of self that wants to be in control, that wants to feel that I exist. Yeah. Okay, I don't mind getting into nimiters, but at least I want to know where I'm at and I want to be there to experience it, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, these aren't small things and it takes a lot of practice. And, you know, I've been to Ajahn Brahm before and said, oh, something happened. And then it stopped me taking the next step. And I thought you'd say, oh, you know, but he just says, yeah, that's, that's part of the process. That's all part of the course. And so it's just about recognizing, getting familiar and gradually getting at ease with these things. Yeah. So again, not to worry. Uh, if these things arise, you're in good company. You're in the company of the Buddha and the great disciples. And they all said that this would happen. And so now it's happening to you. And then the opposite of this, which is closer to craving, I guess fear is a little bit closer to aversion, a very subtle form of aversive states of mind. The next one is elation, the kind of, wow, what's that? <laughs> And this happens especially if you're not familiar, if you heard a lot about these things and it hasn't happened yet, then something happens and either you'll find the mind kind of going, ooh, not sure, or you'll find the mind going, wow. And immediately when that happens, the nimitta or the forms, the shapes, whatever it is you experience will just disappear. Ajahn Ram says that the nimittas are very shy. They only come out when they feel that there's nobody watching. And if they know that you're there and you're trying to pounce on them, they'll run a mile. It's like a little mouse, isn't it? If it comes out of its hole, if there's this cat kind of waiting to pounce, it's not going to come out again for a very long time. 
And this is what happens to the Namitas. They feel like, oh, I'm not safe here. She wants to control me. She wants to possess me. You know, I'm not being controlled. So our minds have to be very subtle and very, very receptive and passive and, and really stay steady and stay content. Yeah. Because again, this is why everything I said in the beginning of the talk is so vital. And there's a danger in talking about these things because the whole point of practice is to um, really learn how to align ourselves with right intention, with making peace, being kind, being gentle. Yeah, making peace is a, a translation for letting go, renouncing control, renouncing ownership. Yeah, just letting things unfold in their own time. And just maintaining a very kind, gentle presence so that whatever wants to arise is welcome to come in. And that includes the clouds, right? That includes the clouds because as the Buddha says in this sutta, you have to learn the cause for that. You should discover the cause for that, whether it's the clouds of doubt, the clouds of elation, I don't know if clouds of elation works. It's more like the really piercing, bright, crazy sunlight that's dancing on the waterfall or something, you know. It's kind of really a bit unsteady, a bit giddy in its quality. Whatever it is, you know, if we can meet it with that sense of kindness and non-ownership, non-control, then things have a chance. They have time to settle down. So going back to the very beginning of... Uh, the discussion. I just wanted to come back to that first uh, little quote from the Buddha because so far we've only really talked about, you know, the mind becoming pure in the state of samadhi. But from there, of course, the mind can fully overcome the defilements of the mind. Because when we start to see things as they really are, and we see that everything arises and passes away, we start to understand that there's no point, that it makes no meaning. There's no meaning in trying to control. How can we control something that by nature arises due to causes and passes away once those causes disappear? You know, aren't we just wasting our energy trying to cling? And so the Buddha says, you know, the whole purpose even of the Satipatthana Sutta is to get to that point where we're mindful just to the extent that wisdom and mindfulness can arise enough to know that there is body, that's all. There's just body, there's just feeling, there's just perception, there's just mental formations and consciousness. And just those things, jnana mataya, patisati mataya, it basically means, it doesn't mean like, um, like that is the ultimate reality. It just means that there are these five khandas and they don't belong to you. There's just Vedana, there's just body, there's just perception. There's not my body, there's not my feeling, my perception, my mental volition and my consciousness. There's just consciousness. Consciousness is consciousness. Consciousness is conscious. There's no one conscious of consciousness. Consciousness is conscious. I mean, that sounds quite co on Mike, but we're moving in this way. And the more we purify our mind and the more we can see the moon free from clouds, see the nature of the mind, the more we have a chance to see these deeper truths that the Buddha taught without, you know, delusion distorting the truth. So going back to the first quote to end, whoever, oh, different one. Okay. Whoever is spotless like the moon, who is pure, serene and unperturbed, who, is, who has destroyed delight in existence, them I call a true Brahmin. So there we go. And my goodness me, I have talked for too long because it's already nine o'clock. <laughs> but uh, I did want to be able to get into that a little bit because I don't normally go into those things too much, but just to give you a bit of a picture and hopefully... Um, in response to something my friend shared earlier today. So that was dedicated to you. I won't say your name, but to all beings everywhere. So may something here be of benefit to you. And just remember 
make peace, be kind and be gentle with your mind and body and the body and mind of all other beings that you may come, come in contact with. Great. 